One year ago, the United Way launched Child Wellbeing to develop a path for thriving children and communities and families. Today's informed partnership breakfast discussion is on building resilient communities for children and youth, which ties together our focus on child well-being and Mental Health Awareness Month. And we hope you'll find today's session both useful personally and professionally. It's my pleasure to introduce Milton Little. In 2007, Milton Little became the first African-American president of the United Way of Greater Atlanta. It is a 125-year-old institution and one of the largest, or the largest, United Way in the national system. Previously, he served as president of the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Before joining United Way, Milton served as chief operating officer and interim president and CEO of the National Urban League. Prior to joining the lead, Milton had a career in corporate philanthropy at AT&T and Lucent Technologies and served as vice president for field operations at MDRC, a nonpartisan education and social policy research organization. Milton serves as chair of the board of directors for Center, Center for Assessment and Policy Development and vice chair of the board for directors for Ways to Work. He's a member of many boards and advisory committees, notably among them the mayoral, Atlanta Mayoral Board of Service, 100 Black Men of Atlanta, I think I recently just read CARE, Rotary Club of Atlanta, Emory Center for Ethics Board of Advisors, Atlanta Speech School, the Woodruff Arts Center Board of Trustees. He graduated mag magna cum laude from Morehouse College with a BA in Sociology, earned an MA in Urban Sociology and so Social Policy from Columbia University. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United Way of Greater Atlanta, Milton J. Little. Jr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Every time I hear that, I remind myself I'm getting older and older and older and older and older. Thank you all for being here. It's good to see you. Um, I don't know how many of you did what I did, but sort of just went right to the gathering spot and then turned around. <laughs> and so, uh, but we're all here, so obviously no one made the real bad mistake of staying there waiting for the crowd to come. So it's heartening to see uh, so many of you here and so many uh, familiar faces uh, for a conversation that is critical to, uh, to Atlanta's families and Atlanta's community. Truth of the matter is that mental health suffers from a major image problem. We don't like to talk about it. We avoid conversations about it. Uh, but study after study show that people associate mental illness with personal failure, as if you did something wrong. And this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, as I think all of you know. And we know that when we talk about child well-being, this has to be part of the conversation. And as with all things, we know better, we do better. And when we join forces to address uh, the needs of children and families, um, then good things are going to happen. But we've got to talk about the critical issues, have those crucial conversations, not be afraid of the topics that uh, other people are afraid of because we know that by thoughtful discussion and focused attention on those issues that we're going to be able to make a difference and a lasting difference uh, for our most vulnerable families and children. So this work of child well-being will require, as you often hear us say, cultural change. And our theory of change is that if a coalition of forces comes together that's focused on child well-being, and it addresses the specific levers, um, we will change outcomes for the better. So this coalition of forces includes nonprofits, philanthropy, government, school systems, the private sector, but most of all, it, it involves each one of you uh, and each one of those who comes to these informed sessions on a consistent basis. We are the coalition that's going to make the difference. And so we generally would go around the room and introduce ourselves, but this room's a little spread out. So what we're gonna ask you to do, just make believe it's Sunday morning at church or synagogue, 
we're just going to ask you to make sure you have introduced yourself to the people at your table. Uh, and so we're going to take just a couple of seconds. Make sure you do that. Um, and if you know the people at your table, find something out about them that you don't know now. So let's put this two, three minutes to productive use. So introduce yourselves to each other. Well, I hope you uh, met somebody new and I hope you learned something new. So let's move on with the program. We have two incredible speakers today and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce them to you. Uh, the first is Dr. Glenda Wren. She is the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity in the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. She also serves as associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She currently oversees the Smart and Secure Children Quality Parenting Program, the Inter Integrated Care Leadership Program. And she has a number of uh, research interests that include strengthening resilience in vulnerable um, populations, addressing the disparity uh, in help seeking for post-traumatic stress uh, disorder among African Americans, and culturally sensitive collaborative care models. Our second speaker is Dr. Erica Fenner Sitkoff, and she recently took the helm of the ex as Executive Director for Voices of Children uh, just uh, a year ago in July of 2017. And she joined Voices in 2014 as the Policy and Outreach Director. Uh, she's a PhD clinical psychologist. She's been an administrator and consultant to school districts on mental health and development, developmental disabilities. She serves as an outstanding leader for Voices as initiatives. Uh, she has steered Voices to facilitate policy change that improves access to quality services for children and families all across systems that impact healthy development, including health insurance, quality health care, early childhood development, child welfare, and juvenile justice. So Dr. Uh, Wren will speak for about 30 minutes or so, uh, and then Erica will come up for about a 15 or so, uh, and then there'll be a dialogue that'll be uh, facilitated by my colleague, Kim Addy, who's the Senior Director for Health. And so please welcome to the stage, uh, Dr. Glenda Wren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milton, for that introduction. And um, thank you to United Way for inviting me to be with you here this morning. Um, so the topic that we're here to discuss is um, about our communities and building resilience. And what I thought I'd do is share some thoughts with you to kind of get your thinking going. Um, and then I'll be followed by another great speaker. And um, we're really both looking forward to dialogue with you. So I won't go into depth into all the details, but hopefully give you enough to kind of whet your appetite and then whatever you'd like to hear more about, we can expand upon in the discussion. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm the director of this newly endowed center at Morehouse School of Medicine. If you'd like to hear more about what we do, you can go to our website at kennedysatcher.org. Um, and we have a number of great leadership programs you heard about, but also some research initiatives that we're doing. And we're very involved in policy work, which I'll speak a little bit about our work in policy um, related to parity today. I wanted to share a little bit about my perspective on mental health equity. And this isn't like a research-based vision, it's just my personal vision for mental health equity. And that is a future where everybody has an opportunity to get high quality mental health care when they need it in settings where they feel welcomed and safe. And in my view, this requires three core components. The first is confidence. People need to have confidence that their inherent dignity is not gonna be violated when they go out to get help. And for many people, this is just not the case. And this contributes to delays in seeking care, um, people dropping out from care because of how they're perceived to be treated or are treated within systems. And there's a lot that we need to do to instill confidence within our communities when they around mental health treatment. The second is about knowledge, and that's where a lot of our community education efforts can play a role. We really need to have a future where accurate knowledge about mental health symptoms, treatments, is common, as common as 
CPR is reflected in our communities, in the media, in our schools, in law enforcement, and there's a number of great initiatives that are um, hoping to advance accurate knowledge around mental health. And the third speaks to how people actually get help for mental health symptoms. In contrast to medical conditions where your symptoms are to the point where they drive you to get help, what we learned about mental health help seeking is that people can walk around with very severe symptoms on the order of decades before they'll get help. And if you look at any epidemiological study, the average length of time that people will wait to get treatment, 10, 15, 20 years. And it's not because this isn't functionally debilitating, it's just the nature of the illness and how people get help. What some of our research has shown is that people really need access to a personal social network. It's not good enough just to be on social media or have a social network. It has to be personal enough that someone's gonna look you in your eye, know you're not doing well, and have the words that you can hear that's gonna help you get to that next place that you need to be. That person could be a school teacher, could be a confidant, could be a mentor, could be um, a primary care doctor, and we need to really create this infrastructure within our communities in order to have an ecosystem of resilience so that we can all thrive. And the overarching principle for this is that there can't be a wrong door. We can't put it on the patient, so to speak, to figure out that they have a problem and navigate all of the difficult systems to get to where they need to be. It doesn't matter whether you go to church, whether you are engaging law enforcement, whether you're getting your social services needs met. If a person interacts with any type of system and there's a mental health need, we need to ensure that that system is able to recognize that there's a need and then align those resources with need. So today I'm going to talk about some of the challenges for achieving mental health equity and parity. And by the end of the talk, hopefully you will know a little bit more about adverse childhood experiences, which you probably already know a little bit about. But I'll talk about adverse community experiences and how exposure to community trauma really impacts treatment engagement and long-term outcomes. And then um, I'll also speak about the role of trauma-informed care and also parent leadership development as a pathway to strengthening our communities. So how do we improve? The overarching goal for equity is to align resources with need. So it's not about making sure that everybody has access to everything, it's making sure that when you need something, you can get it. Whether you need more or a little, we're making that alignment. Um, so first I'll talk about mental health parity. Do people feel like they have a good working knowledge of what I mean when I say parity? You can just raise your hand if you feel so kind of like half the room. Basically, this speaks in general to equal treatment for mental health and substance use disorders and other medical conditions. It typically, this term is used to refer to mental health plans because there is an actual parity law, but you can also think of parity in the broader sense of equity around mental health. Um, so the principle is that if you're treating, if an insurance company is treating diabetes and they cover diabetes in a certain type of way, you have to cover depression in the same type of way. You can't make it harder to get long-term care for depression. You can't say, sorry, you had enough insulin for one person, you're on your own, you know, do what you can. So that is really the case with a lot of mental health conditions in this, and parity um, strives for a future where that's not the case. Um, the other issue with parity is about net network adequacy. What I mean by that is um, if anyone's tried to get any type of behavioral health referral and you have insurance, you're given a list usually of people that you know take that insurance. And myself, I'm on one of these panels because I'm required to for my job at the School of Medicine, but I only see patients 30% of the time. And I actually only see patients one day a week at the VA. So if you're not actually a woman veteran, I'll never be able to see you. And I work in primary care at Grady the other 20% of the time. So if you're not cared for at a Grady clinic, I won't be able to see you. But on my office line at Morehouse School of Medicine, I get these heartbreaking messages that are left for me. Like, I saw your name, and I'm just wondering if you're taking new patients, and I'll usually get like five minutes of their personal story. That's an example of network inadequacy. So my name's listed on these insurance panels, and when you look at the list, it looks like, oh, you have plenty of psychiatrists there, but who's taking new patients? If you don't have people that are taking new patients, if they don't have accessibility, then you don't have an adequate network. And that's something that Parity really wants to ensure that there's transparency to make sure that the network is adequate. 
then I talked a little bit about medical necessity and treatment limitations before. And that's another issue where in the past insurers have limited care because it is costly to provide mental health care, but it's more costly to not provide care in the long term. So in 2008, there was a federal act that was um, passed by Congress to ensure equal treatment for mental illness and addiction. The federal government then in 2013 released um, guidelines for the law being implemented. But before that law, typically in, uh, treatment was covered at lower levels um, for mental health than it was for physical health. But whether or not a plan is actually covered by parity law depends on a number of factors, including who's enrolled and also the size of the plan. And at this, so that's a federal law, but many states have some type of legislation that also speaks to parity. Some states have stronger parity laws than federal, some have weaker. If a state has a weaker law, then the federal law will proceed and you have to be compliant with the federal parity law. Um, what we've been a part of is efforts to inform the states on how to strengthen the federal law by state legislation. So in October of 2018, we'll be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the parity law, and um, Patrick Kennedy, who was the congressman from Rhode Island, was the lead sponsor of that bill, and he's also the individual that helped to start the center here in Atlanta. And so we have a number of things that we're working on to kind of celebrate the 10th anniversary, to figure where we've gone in those past two years but also to try to kind of have a state of the states on where are we actually in terms of implementing parity and enforcing it. Because it's, it's great to have a law, we need to have a law, but a law is only as good as it is implemented and enforced. So we'll be coming out with a scorecard um, and really helping to engage local advocates to help equip them to engage this topic um, and also inform the public, because it's a very technical, not that interesting, complicated topic parody. And regular people only understand, like, I have a problem, I can't get help for it. Like, everyone can understand that. But then beyond that, is it, you know, utilization? Is it NQ2Ls? I mean, my head spins when I think about this, and this is kind of what I do every day. So what we're trying to do is really translate it into bite-sized pieces of information that we can engage the public so that we can hold not just the, the insurance companies accountable, but also leverage the state insurance commissioner whose job it is to enforce parity. And we need for regular people to understand where they can go if they feel like they're not getting what they need and how they can advocate on behalf of themselves and their families to have stronger laws so that they can get the help that they need. So um, one of the references that I'll mention that the Kennedy Forum developed is called parityregistry.org, and it's a place that you can go. We're, we're using this registry to collect information to understand the landscape of violations or potential violations. Um, it's difficult because um, people don't know if it's a violation or not. It's, it's kind of a process of figuring out if it's an actual violation, but legislators don't have the actual data from the field. So if myself as a provider, yourself as a person with a condition, you live this every day. I was very surprised in um, talking to legislators that they're like, well, we don't have the stories. We don't know how big of, you just have one or two anecdotes. So there's a lack of data that's documenting what is a very obvious problem to people that are living it. And that's one of the functions of Parity Registry. And we're, we're working with partners. And if you're interested in learning more about this, I'd be happy to connect with you because we really want to connect with folks that are engaged in the community to find out where, where are the gaps in education and what can we do to help inform people about engaging this topic. Um, so that's a little bit about parity. Again, we can talk about that more in discussion if you're interested. But in terms of disparities, this, this does relate because a lack of parity and a lack of equity makes disparities get worse, prevents them from being eliminated. And differences in care can be for a number of reasons. It could just be because you have a different type of condition, because you have different preferences. But a disparity of care happens when the structure of the system is creating an inequity. So it's not something that an individual will do, it's something about how the system is set up that's making, you're never gonna get those two points to come together because the system is set up in an inequitable way. The other major cause for disparities are discrimination, biases, and stereotypes that we know exist for uh, minority populations and also with those that have mental health disorders and substance use disorders. Now I really like the CDC definition for 
um, mental health disparities because it helps break it down into the kind of subtypes of it. And one of the major ones that I see a lot is a disparity of intention. So mental health is a big problem. I mean, you all probably know some of the stats on suicide. We're all talking about the opioid epidemic. These, these problems have to become an incredible magnitude before they get public attention versus other conditions like Zika or Ebola. I mean, a lot of people were impacted by that, but if you actually do a side-by-side -side comparison, there's a great disparity in attention that serious public mental health crises um, are given compared to other conditions of equal magnitude. So that's what we call a disparity in attention. And the second has to do with how people achieve health if you have a mental health disorder versus not. And there's a big disparity. We know that people are dying on average 25 years younger if they have a serious mental illness. And it's not because of their mental illness. It's because of undertreated or untreated medical conditions and other unhealthy lifestyles that these individuals are vulnerable to for some reason. And again, we're not going to be able to achieve equity. We're losing all of the resources that these individuals could provide to our society because we're not keeping them healthy. And then in terms of access, there's disparities there between populations on how they can get access, if at all, the quality of care in mental health. It's still one of those disciplines where you can hang up a shingle and have a cash practice and live very nice and never have to do anything with insurance. So when you look at the workforce issues here in Georgia, you can look at the raw numbers of people that are board certified or certified to, to practice, and you wonder, like, seems like it shouldn't be as bad as it is, but not everybody's playing the game. Game. Not everybody accepts Medicaid. Not everybody accepts insurance at all. So we have to be more creative in coming up with a different way of deploying limited resources. Because let's be honest, we're never going to have the number of resources that the population needs. Never going to match up one on one. So we have to be more thoughtful in how do you leverage the limited resources that you have in a more effective way. One example of how we do that is with integrated care, collaborative care. Um, and in terms of disparities, um, what gets measured gets treasured, right? If you're not tracking the um, disparities in child health outcomes or in mental health, it's not going to get attention. So we always have to advocate for making sure that we're wondering how are subpopulations really doing. You can't just look at the population as a whole and see how are we doing on average. You have to see where are there gaps, where are there inequities. Um, so integration in primary care is one way that we've been involved in efforts to try to address the workforce shortage, try to eliminate disparities, and promote health equity in the realm of mental health. It's very important for the reasons I mentioned with the lack of numbers that we have on specialists, and we know it works. There have been over 100 studies, probably more by now, that demonstrate the um, cost effectiveness and the efficacy of integration of behavioral health in primary care settings and actually even other settings, including schools and other community settings. But it's really hard to implement and it's still very challenging to fund. And those are one of the major barriers to why it's not usual care. Um, but the good news is that things are changing. We now have new policies like collaborative care billing codes that allow you to bill for these um, services together. Um, a lot of insurers are looking at value-based payments where you can kind of bundle the services caring for a defined population that allows you to be innovative in the way in which you provide care. And one thing that we've done is try to support um, communities and health clinics that aren't kind of the leading edge of innovation because they often will serve the most needy populations. And they're like, integrated care, I heard about it, but I don't know how to do it. It seems kind of complicated. So we developed our integrated care leadership program to help practices, providers, um, administrators learn the basics. We pulled all the knowledge together. We walk you through a learning collaborative so that you can kind of get up to speed and find out maybe you can't do a full-on implementation of integrated care, but you can now learn what does measurement-based care mean and how can I improve the quality of care in primary care by using some type of validated measure to know if someone's doing well or not. Because if you look at prescribing patterns, most of the psychotropic medications are actually being prescribed by pediatricians and primary care providers. How are they knowing how they're using it? They're not trained clinically the way that a behavioral health specialist are. They're probably saying, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing better. I'm doing worse. Okay, that's good. You know, is that good enough? 
the data suggests that it's not good enough. So we talk to our providers and our um, clinics about how you can implement measurement-based care to make sure that people are actually getting better and you're not having unintentional inertia or just doing the same thing regardless of how people are doing. So it improves access for patients because patients are usually connected to primary care. You can get appointments in a timely manner and it's less stigmatizing. I, also, I work primarily in primary care settings and even as a psychiatrist, it can be difficult for me to talk a patient into going to a specialty care environment because it's just a different culture, it's unfamiliar, there's a whole host of reasons and a lot of patients we can successfully manage in a primary care setting if you have the right supports in place. Um, and it also helps to increase the capacity of mental health providers. I can take care of a much larger number of individuals serving as a consultant to the primary care team than I can seeing a patient one at a time. If I have a registry, I might be able to take care of the same panel as a primary care doctor because I'm looking at an objective measure and I'm seeing who's not getting better and then I'm only focusing in those individuals that are more complicated. It allows me to have job satisfaction because I'm operating at the top of my discipline. I'm using all of the skills that are specific to a psychiatrist and it's also really fun working with a team. So that's my little pitch for working in integrated care. I really do enjoy it. Um, we know that mental health costs, right? And this is the slide I use anytime I want to try to make a case for funding anything I want to do in mental health. Because it doesn't matter what your medical concern is, if it's HIV, if it's diabetes, if it's obesity, hypertension, you are going to have a subpopulation that have mental health co-occurring conditions or substance use disorders, and they are going to cost you a tremendous amount of money. They are the people that aren't getting better. They're the ones that are utilizing emergency services. And these are just some examples of the numbers when you have a person with a behavioral health diagnosis, the per member per month cost increases 100, 200, sometimes even 300% of the cost. So it's pretty nice that you can pick any topic that's the priority of your community, of a health care system, of an insurer, and say, we care about those individuals struggling with mental health. Let's talk about how we can improve the outcomes for these people. We also know, though, that not all integration efforts are, are effective, and some just don't work at all. Like, if you just go out and do education for my primary care and that's it, it's not going to necessarily make anyone better. It's not been shown to improve outcomes. Also, you know, screening is really important, but if all you do is screen and you don't have any system in place to respond to the screening results, sometimes you can do more harm than good in that way. Um, also, if you just say, let's get some behavioral health people and put them in primary care, that doesn't work either because the cultures of behavioral health and primary care are so different. And you have to really kind of adapt. I have to get used to being interrupted in the middle of talking with someone. I have to be used to having a shorter assessment time and not spending 60 minutes meeting someone for the first time. And so not everyone is appropriate for working in that setting. Um, also, if you have just a disease management approach, like if you only take the most expensive or most difficult patients and you try to just do something separate for them, like a one-off behavioral health thing, and you're not working with primary care, that also has been shown not to work. But stepped collaborative care is a very effective model of care, and it kind of makes sense, right? You want to treat the people that have mild to moderate conditions in primary care with limited supports, and then it should increase in severity from there so that you're aligning the intensity of treatment and the kinds of care and the level of care which was with what is needed for the patient. So any, any more talk about integrated care, I could talk all day about that. But I'm going to move on to trauma-informed systems because this is really exciting to me. Now, who's heard of ACEs? I hope a lot of hands go up. Okay, good. So we've all heard about, or most of us have heard about, adverse childhood experiences. This was a Kaiser study that was done years ago by Dr. Folletti, who was uh, treating obesity and kind of found like, a lot of these patients aren't doing well with their obesity. What's going on? And then he started asking them questions and realized that many of them had very significant exposures to childhood adverse experiences that had long-standing impacts on their health as an adult. And since then, we've learned that ACEs can have lasting impacts on pretty much every adverse health condition. If you have particularly a score of 5 or greater out of 10, you're at much higher risk for having hypertension, um, heart disease, um, negative health behaviors like smoking, alcohol use, as well as limitations in your life potential and achieving your, your life potential. So there's been, you can look at this from a preventive perspective, like let's try not to have children experience adverse experiences, but it's also really important to know that children that survive and become parents that have high ACE scores 
they also need help too. And there's ways that you can interject that intergenerational transmission of trauma to try to reset that cycle and create a more healing, resilient cycle. This is just a quick slide to show the mechanism of how adverse childhood experiences lead to early death. So in the first phase, there's disrupted neural development of the child just from the, the trauma, elevations, and cortisol. And that may lead to some difficulties in their social-emotional development and their behavior. Then they may also then adopt you know, negative health behaviors. Maybe they have behavioral problems that make them... Um, engage with law enforcement, that leads to elevations in risk for disease and disability and early death. Um, so in our healthcare kind of medical world, patient-centered medical home is one of the emerging models for treating someone as a whole person and kind of having the system meet the needs of the person. So it's really designed to not require the patient to go around and figure out all of what they need, but to have the system wrap around them. And I think this is very intuitive to those of us that work in community, because you realize like, yes, your specialty may be why, and that's what you're good at, and you should do that, because that's what you're trained to do. But if you're taking care of a human being that needs A through Z, you can't ignore that but for so long if you're a responsible person. Like at some point you're just like, well, I'd like to give you Y, but you need to have A through D first to come to Y because otherwise you'll leave, so what am I gonna do about that? And that's really where this collaboration, where us working together is critical to success. And in medicine, we're a little slow on the uptake sometimes, but we're now kind of realizing that we have to have a whole person orientation because you can't you know, fix your diabetes if you don't have a home. Or like they say, children's that, children that are mad and sad can't add. You know, if, if, you're, if you're hungry, you're not gonna be able to focus in school. You have to address the social determinants of health. Now the next level that we're trying to push the field is being trauma-informed. Again, taking it away from the individual PTSD, yes, that's a condition, we should treat that in individuals, but what about the way in which people interact with their institutional systems? If you look at it from the lens of a community member that has a history of not being treated well by institutions, that has a fundamental fracture in their ability to have trust, they're gonna experience everything within your system differently. How are they greeted when they come into the door? What are the expectations of them when they're asked to kind of learn your culture and your practices of how you check in and how you sit in the waiting room. Um, how do they interpret rules like how a no-show is treated or I'm late, you know? If you have, if you're dependent upon transportation to get you to your appointment and you have no control over when that ride comes and you're 20 minutes late and the front desk person is typing on their computer and says, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to reschedule, what does that do in terms of outcomes? A, that person can't get better because they're not actually getting care. B, are they likely to come back to the next appointment? If they do, will they have an attitude when they interact with their provider? You know, if you take these things in isolation, it's easy to blame the patient. But my bias, I guess, is to really challenge the system to say, I think we can design the system better so that it's easier for people to get what they need because it's hard enough dealing with this problems as it is, let alone overcoming all the internal stigma and external challenges to getting help. So um, I'm working on a project that's funded by Kaiser to work with primary care practices to see how can they be more more trauma informed. And this isn't just about screening for ACEs, it includes really interesting things like where is the scale in the clinic? You know, how do people feel about being weighed out there in the open? Um, how is the waiting area perceived? Are there, is there overstimulation in the environment? Is it too loud and, and difficult for someone that has a history of trauma? So there's a lot of um, great innovators out there that are working to try to change their systems. Um, I'm not going to go through these slides in detail. This comes from the National Center for Childhood Traumatic Stress that goes through some of the characteristics of trauma-informed systems. So screening for uh, trauma exposure and understanding how it impacts not just PTSD but other conditions is important. Having culturally based, evidence-based treatments available, making resources available for children and families as well as intentional efforts to increase resilience and enhance protective factors, because you can't always prevent a trauma from occurring, but you can create a response that allows an individual to regain their functioning and thrive. And then recognizing the multi-generational, intergenerational effect of trauma is critical, because if you're a child person treating the child, you're treating the whole family. If you're treating a parent, you're treating the child. There's really not a great way to really separate those things and help our systems of care. 
And then providers, you gotta help the providers too because it's pretty tough work, right? Working in communities, dealing with trauma and exposed underserved populations can be difficult for us as well. And we have to make sure that we're not burnt out, that we're bringing our best selves to work every day. How am I doing on time? Someone will tell me when I need to, five, five minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, so I talked a little bit about the Kaiser Learning Collaborative that we're doing on trauma-informed primary care. Project Thrive is another research project that we are doing, that we just completed, we're wrapping up now at Grady, that focuses on culturally centered integrated care. So I talked about integration of behavioral health and primary care, but what about individuals that have different cultural beliefs that, you know, people kind of don't have an idea of how the pancreas is. I mean, most people don't think about their pancreas and like what it does and how it works, if it's good or bad, right, right? I mean, I never did before I went into medicine. But like people have a thought about their mind. Like everybody has something in their head about what a mind is, what it isn't, how it works, what happens when it's broken, what does it mean if it's messed up? Like people have a framework. So you're not operating with a blank slate when you're talking about mental health. So you have to find some type of way to close that gap between where you're starting out with, with your beliefs about what a mind is, what does it mean to be mentally well versus unwell, how do you interpret a mental health symptom, what explanatory model do you, do you have, and then how do you walk someone that you think has a treatable mental health condition to the point of identifying that as such and then saying that some type of treatment is appropriate from a medical system, and then that other step of maybe even a medication. So there's a lot of hurdles for people that have different cultural backgrounds, and so we did some work engaging primarily African-American communities on what would help you to be comfortable with seeking help for this, and what do you need from your providers? And just kind of, we wrote a paper about this, but one of the interesting findings was that people kind of wanted to try before you buy. They didn't want to have to be like, I have to go to the specialty system and just do whatever they tell me to do. They wanted to kind of figure out like, well, what are you going to do? And how's it going to be? You know, they wanted to have some confidence that you're not going to be all up in my head doing stuff I don't understand and I can't change. So a lot of things that we can do in the community with education can demystify what it even means to get mental health treatment. And people wanted to see their providers in their community. Now, we did focus groups. Every single focus group, we didn't even ask a question about this. This came up in the conversations. I want to see my provider in the community. So when you guys host events, you know, we need to be there. Because for every one person that sees a relatively normal psychiatrist, I like to, I like to think that I am, you know, not scary, you know, not going to do any, anything harmful to you, maybe it makes it a little bit easier the next time when someone suggests that they should see a psychiatrist because they've actually seen one with their own eyes and it wasn't weird, you know, like these things matter and the community has talked about that and they don't want to be told what's wrong with them because they know they have problems. You know, of course I'm depressed. I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I've got this problem. They're completely aware of that, but, you know, partnership and respecting the expertise of community is really important too. So when we get out of our, our four walls and get out there in the community, it goes such a long way of building knowledge within the community so that the people that are gonna be the first to identify a problem will say, I know exactly what you need to do and where you need to go for that. Okay, so I will end on talking a little bit about community resilience. So this um, was work that came out of the Prevention Institute, and um, I really encourage you to re read this full report. I'm just gonna present some of the highlights here, talking about adverse community experiences and resilience. So we have come a long way in recognizing that trauma is prevalent, and it has a really significant impact, not just on individuals, but on whole communities. When a community has been exposed to trauma in a pervasive way, it really kind of saps the strength of a community and it can prevent them from achieving their full potential. So that's, I mean, I'm glad that we finally can agree on that now. And what we find is that community trauma is not just the sum of individual trauma in the neighborhood. There's something more that happens to a community when they've been constantly exposed to repeated trauma, when they get numbed out and desensitized, when it's just like, oh, those are gunshots. That's what happens at this time. There is something that happens at a community level that's beyond the individual impacts of trauma. 
So when these are some of the manifestations or <laughs> symptoms of community level trauma in the social, cultural, physical, built and economic environments. So you have intergenerational poverty for example, is one of the symptoms. You have long-term unemployment when you look at a community level. You see relocation of businesses and jobs. So there's not even opportunity because the best opportunities don't wanna be in that neighborhood. You see disinvestment across the board in those communities. And then on the physical, you see de deterioration of the environment. So yes, you should all exercise and eat vegetables, but if it's not safe to be outside and exercise, you're gonna to wanna to keep your children home and not leave them outside. If you don't have access to fresh vegetables because the grocery store doesn't wanna be in your neighborhood, how far, how can you afford to go as far as you'll need to go to get those healthy foods? Can you afford them when you get there? These are some of the, the symptoms. Um, and then what's worse, it's bad enough that you can't get access to the things that will help you, but you're actually marketed unhealthy products. So plenty of liquor stores and cigarettes that are available in your community, but the other lifestyle that you want is back ordered and you may not ever get it in your community. And then on the people, you see disconnection um, between social connectedness. So there's big disconnects within these communities as well as um, kind of normalization and elevation of destructive, distracting um, social norms. So kind of the antisocial norms become accepted and the other norms, like most people, they don't grow up saying I wanna be like a criminal. It's not like a life goal that most people will set for themselves. But for communities that are impacted by trauma over a long period of time, they, they can reset their norms to where these things are expected and they don't, they don't have the internal potential recognized within themselves that they are meant for something much more. So a resilience framework suggests that we should nurture the ability of a community to recover from and thrive despite the prevalence of their adverse conditions. So what can we do to create an ecosystem that will help people to overcome those limitations in their community? And how can we approach healing from a community level to identify and utilize all the strengths that are in a community? Tremendous amount of resourcefulness and strengths exist in our communities, let me be clear. They are not just sitting around waiting for us to do something. There are people working harder than any of us can ever imagine just to survive, and that grit alone is something that we can learn from. So I, it's just a matter of providing the limited nutrients that they've been starved from to unlock and unleash their own potential that's been just cooped up in there. Sorry, I feel kind of passionate about it, if you can tell. <laughs> so, so the solution here is that we have, to, we have to do everything now, all at once, all together. Like that, That's the bottom line of the slide. You can't just do one little thing and think it's gonna work. It takes all of us working together, doing everything that we can with what we have in front of us. So I uh, will take my last minute talking about one, our multi-state project on parent leadership development. We've worked in 13 states um, putting together these child advocacy and health equity coalitions. And the, the crux of it is a parenting program, but it's so much more than that. It's the way in which we try to activate change in communities. Um, so our program is a six to 12, 10 session program for parents that talks about positive parenting, improving mental health, improving parental efficacy. I mean, there's nothing like so surprising about this list is all the things that we know people should know and want to do. But the question is, how are you gonna take in information? You know, if I go to those communities and sit up at a podium like this and tell you how you should raise your kids, how would you feel about that? I wouldn't listen to myself, right? But if you're talking to a friend or someone that you trust or someone that you've known their whole life, you might listen to something that they're saying. So that's what we do. We work to support parents, we mentor them, we develop leadership in them, then they mentor someone else and those someone else's are out there facilitating groups. So it's a three-tiered leadership development ap approach. The narratives on life change that have happened with these individuals is remarkable. I mean, the average family income of our parents is less than 20,000 a year. They start our program, many of them graduate, and it's the only thing that they've graduated from in their whole life. But they leave our program wanting more. They leave our program wanting to say, how do I start a nonprofit? Um, how do I advocate for cleaning up my neighborhood? They start to ask these questions that we're like, oh, this is so good. Now we don't do that, but let me tell you who you need to go to for that. So we have a lot of partners, other organizations that help to cultivate what we have hopefully unleashed in these individuals. And I wanted to show a picture of um, our graduation on the upper left, some of our parents in sessions, and in the upper right is um, 
one of our first inaugural parents who now actually works at Morehouse School of Medicine. We have two parent graduates that actually are now employed at Morehouse School of Medicine. And then Mr. Clem on the top right, his passion was chess. He always loved um, playing chess, he's good at it. And he went through our program after growing up in a group home, being homeless with his family for a time, saw a flyer for the program, went through that, and then said, you know, how can I merge what I've learned with parenting with chess? How can I help students not just learn how to play, but like learn how to compete? How can I cultivate their parents? His story was so inspiring when I had him speak to the head of a United um, Health Foundation. The foundation director gave him a $10,000 check on the spot. And I was like, I was moved to tears. Um, and this is just one of hundreds of stories that of lives that we've impacted with this program. So I will leave you with this. Don't despise small beginnings. Work within your sphere of influence because one person can do so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank the United Way. Um, they have been incredible partners with us in this work. And the momentum that we have seen in Georgia, which is powerful, and you're learn more about um, over the next few minutes. Would not have happened without them. So we're incredibly thankful. And I want to thank Dr. Rem because um, we cannot underestimate the importance of having this resource in Georgia. So I'm thrilled to be here today with her. Voices for Georgia's Children is a not-for-profit statewide child policy and advocacy organization. Um, we have the benefit of um, working on all issues that impact child well-being. Because uh, similar to the points that Dr. Wren raised, if you don't address the whole child, you're only going to get but so far at advancing their well-being in any one area. Um, and so we, we advocate for policies, laws, and state investment um, for the betterment of children. So often in these conversations, um, there are a lot of adults talking to other adults. Um, but to really get to the bottom of a problem and identify a solution that will really make a difference, we have to hear from and really truly listen to the people that we are trying to help, and that's the youth themselves. Because if we don't listen to them, they are going to show us with their behavior. And as we've seen increasingly, um, their behavior is leading to loss of life. Um, we have an increase in, in suicides, not only nationally, but in our state. And so Voices, with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation that heads up our Child Fatality Review, um, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Dis Disabilities, Department of Family and Children's Services, Children's Hospital of Atlanta, and the Department of Education came together to lift up the youth voice. And so I want to start my, my conversation with you with bringing the youth into the room with us. In my eighth grade year, I tried to kill myself. I actually tried four times. My freshman year, I tried to overdose on pills. I have attempted suicide once. I tried to overdose on like 20 pills. Last year, I had a suicide attempt. I was really lonely, it just kind of felt like nobody cared. I thought it would be better just to end it. I felt like no one was there for me. I was thinking, you know, a lot of this pressure would be taken off of me. I was just tired of being hurt. Why me? Why was I put on this earth just to have that happen to me? No matter what life gives at you or throws at you, there's always a way to overcome it. I recommend talking to anyone that's been through the same situation or counselor or someone. Some people think that talking to someone else is a sign of giving in. It's not that at all. It's, it's realizing that you are having this problem and you're trying to fix it. You're not the only one who has this problem. Other kids have the problem. And by working together, you can get through it. There's so many things that can help and you may not even know. I didn't know there were so many resources out there. You just have to speak up. If my suicide attempt was actual, like I wasn't here today, I'm so glad that I'm here. So we produced um, several different videos like this with 
youth from across the state of Georgia, ranging from 30 seconds to 17 minutes long. And I encourage you, all of you to take, a, take the 17 minutes to watch it because they are courageous and they are telling us what we need to know to address this issue in our communities. And overwhelmingly, and most of the youth did not know each other, they said a lot of the same things. They are feeling overwhelming pressure at school and it wasn't just that one test that they took that they failed that put them over the edge. It was the fact that they were drops and drops and drops that filled that bucket over time that we didn't hear or pay attention to. And it was that final one, that final drop that just overflowed the bucket and they couldn't take it anymore. Um, and overwhelmingly so, they wanted people to just simply ask them to notice and ask and to be able to recognize those signs and just ask them. Um, and that they wanted at least one person, just one person to connect to, to have that personal connection with. And it didn't need to be a whole bunch. It just needed to be that one. So when we go to, to, to address a problem or we hear that, um, we want to first look at data, because at least that can help us direct where some of our most needed or where, where our efforts could be most effective. So I wanted you to just take a moment and look at the numbers on the screen and just take like 30 seconds to think about what maybe those numbers represent. So first, it tells us a little bit more about the problem. And I'm speaking specifically from Georgia. All of this data comes from Georgia. About eight years ago, um, the state of Georgia entered into a settlement agreement um, with, with the, the United States government. And it was about adult access to services. And it was a huge movement in helping to create access to care for specifically uh, mental health, behavioral health, and developmental disabilities for adults. The result of that meant over the past eight years, the child serving systems were starved. Being completely honest, they didn't get any new investment. Um, and that, and, and we, we've started to turn the tide, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's important to know because if you don't continually nourish the system, it's going to have an impact, and we're seeing that. Um, the top three leading causes of why kids aren't in school, the, the leading reasons why children are absent, are health related. The first one is asthma. The second is oral pain, because for those of you that have experienced oral pain, you know you cannot concentrate at work or in a meeting, and, and um, it's incredibly painful. And the third is, is mental health. And, and typically, um, that, that can result in one of two ways. One is through discipline, because we don't reckon, appropriately recognize the signs of what's going on, and kids are disciplined um, and given out of school suspension. And the other is they simply can't get out of bed, or they are really struggling. And they miss about three times as many days of school um, as their peers. Georgia does this amazing thing. We, we conduct a survey, the Department of Education conducts a survey every year. It's called the Georgia Student Health Survey, and it gives us a lot of information. And for people who want to continue to think that this isn't as big of a problem as it is, our kids are telling us in the way that they are candidly completing this survey. And um, in 2016, more than 80,000 kids reported considering harming themselves. That is huge. But what that's telling us is they're willing to say it if we're willing to listen. Um, the, the next number is um, shocking to most people. Um, that children, that a child as young as nine years old actually gets the concept of taking their life. And things are so horrible to them and overwhelming that they took action to do that. And what this tells us is that it's not about just high school students that kids much younger are having these thoughts and taking action, and we have to start addressing it and determining developmentally appropriate ways to address it in elementary school. I speak to, um, to psychiatric nurses in the emergency rooms, and they see kids as young in four and five coming in, um, coming in with this. 
I spoke about um, kids missing school because they're getting out of school suspension because we're not effectively recognizing the signs. Um, our, our juvenile justice system does an incredible job at deploying and investing in mental health resources for kids involved in the system. And what we know is that about 65 to 75% of the youth that enter a juvenile detention facility in Georgia have a diagnosable mental illness. Often it's, it's, um, it's symptoms of P, uh, PTS, uh, PTSD, but we know that if we could address that earlier on, um, there could be a different outcome. Dr. N touched on workforce. I can't emphasize this enough. We have a shortage across our state, and what does that look like? 76 of our counties don't have a licensed psychologist, let alone a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, and 52 counties don't have a licensed clinical social worker. Combine that, we've got about 45 of our counties that have no licensed psychologist, social worker, or psychiatrist. So we have to start thinking differently about how we reach those communities. Because to be honest, we're not going to get everybody with that kind of degree or licensure to move there. The, the last one on the screen I bring up because, again, often people don't realize, and it has to do with sustaining and getting those resources to communities. About 140,000 of our children in Georgia don't have health insurance, despite being eligible for Medicaid or Peach Care. That's huge. And if you think about that, um, and I often hear this and I, and I try and address it head on, well, don't psychiatrists make enough? Don't psychologists make enough? They should just keep, they should just take people for free. And I can understand that to an extent, except for if that's all you're doing, one, people are not going to go to communities where they can't create a livelihood for their own family. And two, something simple as how do you pay the rent of the facility? Like there needs to be some generation of, of income. And these children are eligible. So creating a system that allows them to have continual access to healthcare coverage that will then help feed the system of providers to be able to meet their needs is critical. And the last, the last data point I'll, I'll have that I, that I didn't um, make it into, into my presentation, but I was reminded of it, of my dear friend who's with the Department of Early Care and Learning, Brandy, this morning, that 15,000 children last year in pre-K through third grade received out-of-school suspension. The rates of our young children being told that they not, cannot come to school rival that of high school. I don't know what a four-year-old could do that is so bad that they are told they cannot come to school, but if you think about the impact of a child's first experience with their education setting, and they are told they are not welcome, what that does to their mental schema of like what it means for their ability to succeed academically move on. We are seeding that in our young kids. But I'm happy to say um, that there's a great deal of power and momentum in Georgia to address that. Um, the first one has to do with the problem I just stated, that this past legislative session, our legislature passed a bill that required any school system for children in pre-K through third grade that they could not be suspended um, for more than five days without putting them through the multi-tiered support system of supports to get the appropriate screenings that we need to see what are the underlying issues that could be leading to that behavior, which could be something like vision. They're not seeing, they're not seeing the board and their behavior is, is telling us that. Um, or a language deficit. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the work of uh, Voices and our partners and of our legislature for recognizing we have to do something and can't continue to, um, to close the doors to, to our kids. Um, we have a strong Child and Adolescent Health Coalition here, and the thing that I am most proud about that Voices chairs it with the American Academy of Pediatrics is that we have universities represented, we have providers in the community represented, and we also have state agencies represented. Um, the, the director of the, of the behavioral health program at DJJ comes to those meetings, the assistant superintendent of the DOE comes. I mean, it is truly a partnership between advocates, providers, and, um, and government agencies to try and get to the underlying problems and solve them for children's health in our state. 
We've had convenings on school-based health understand the important aspect of meeting kids where they are every day. Um, more than 70 people from around the city. So there's a swell of interest and commitment to doing something about the issue. And in 2015, um, there were multiple study committees, and this is how the legislature works to, um, to dive deeper into an issue. Because so many people, the, the um, advocates in the communities, providers were speaking up, the legislature listened, and in the House and Senate, they had, they had um, study committees. And, and overwhelmingly, the recommendations were, we have to look more at school-based access, integrated care, workforce. Um, and really, what we need is um, a push to have a coordinated statewide plan. Still after that, honestly, nothing really concrete takes shape. We thought, OK, um, we have to do something. Our governor has been in, in, you know, invested in this. He's got about a year and a half left in his term. We have to do something in the immediate. Um, and we pulled together a letter. And again, it had all different players signing on to that letter, from agency leadership to providers. And the, the last group to co-sign on to that letter that we made sure to put at the top of the list um, was the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. And so I say the people that you think may be least likely are not down for the cause or may not be automatically bought in, this issue is deeply personal and touches everybody. And it has an impact in everything. And so we shouldn't be afraid to ask. And we shouldn't be afraid to, uh, to approach people who aren't typically sitting in, in these conversations like this. Um, because I, I really do believe having them signed on is what helped lead the governor to establishing the Children's Mental Health Commission last June that led to the recommendations that came out of there um, to, um, that led to some really significant investment I'm going to talk about in a second. But never us underestimate you all here today and the connections that you have that you might not think would necessarily like, be bought into this or co-sign because you'd be surprised um, that they will. So this past legislative session, we have about $23 million of new money that was not in the system before invested in children's mental health. And there are people that I speak to that say, well, I'm not going to give them a cookie for doing something they were supposed to do. Like, of course, they said, and $23 million is not enough. Well, I will tell you, for a system that has been starved for eight years, $23 million is an incredible catalyst to keep this conversation going and to infuse some capital and some specific programs that can ideally take shape and push our movement forward. And that money came in the form of suicide prevention, um, allowing the hotline that exists right now that you saw on the screen in the video be able to be open more hours um, to create an innovative program of texting for support, which if you know youth today, they are really savvy at that. Um, so it is actually going to make a meaningful difference. It also included more than $4 million to, ex to expand our school-based mental health program. Um, which we've overwhelmingly heard from communities, as, as you heard from the youth, having someone that they see every day um, that they can call upon when they're having a moment um, is huge. Um, there's funding in for opioid prevention, for wraparound services in communities. So I really believe that this is going to make a critical difference, but it's going to be about people like you in the room, um, and your colleagues learning more about that investment, um, how to take it further, um, and talking about why it's so important so that it doesn't go away. We, I, I, um, sometimes, and I don't know if, if Dr. Wren experiences this in her national travels, but I often hear sometimes about um, Georgia or the South and what we're not doing and what we should be doing and we should be more like Connecticut or Massachusetts or California. But I have to tell you, there is some incredible work happening here. Um, and a big part of building resilient communities is looking at what they're actually doing that is bringing about results and lifting that up and supporting that and not saying, that's so great you're doing that, but you really should look at, have you seen this program that's happening over here? No, they're, they're showing us what's working and we need to support that and many of you are connected to those programs. We have more than a thousand schools trained in positive behavior intervention supports and we have seen the data that shows that that has a significant impact on children not being sent home, but actually being listened to and, and understood the underlying reason what's going on and keep them and keeping them in school. 
Um, we also had, um, and we thought outside the box, for years we were told, you can't use Medicaid dollars as a match for school nurses. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, I will tell you, Georgia's one of the first states that figured out how. And we just got that passed. And because of that, we're going to bring tens of million of more dollars without spending any additional state dollars, but just using our state dollars as a match to draw down federal funding to increase the number of school nurses. I don't know how many of you all know that technically, in statute, you don't have to be an actual nurse to be a school nurse, that you can be coordinators that are supervised by school nurses. But what this new funding is going to do is help put more registered nurses um, in, in schools. And it's, it's incredibly innovative. Um, we have 30 school-based health centers in the state, and if you have never seen one, I strongly encourage you to go check one out. There are people in this room, including me, that can connect you and go take a look, because it is life-changing for the students and staff in that school and the community. We, I mean, the outcomes speak for itself. We see in some cases as much as a 50% reduction in kids going to the ER for asthma. And if you remember, I said asthma is the leading reason why kids are out of school. Um, so it's, it's been instrumental, and you'll learn a little bit more about that in a second. Um, we have something called Mental Health First Aid. More than 90 of our 159 counties have gotten training in that, and the reason is not because we initially had funding, and actually we initially had funding for three counties, but the word spread. For the superintendents that initially got that training, they were telling their, their peers and other superintendents that their schools got this training, which is basically like first aid for mental health. It helps teach really everybody in the school. People that work in the cafeteria, the bus drivers, teachers recognize those early signs for what they are and being able to ask those follow-up questions and help connect students with resources. Um, and lastly, I'll say we had 33 youth come forward to tell their story on camera knowing that it was going to be broadcast and we were going to try and blanket the state with it. And so if they are willing to come forward and tell their, their very personal stories, the least we can do as adults is to listen to them and take what they have to say seriously and try and build solutions around that and to continue to lift up their voice. So you guys can read this. I think you get an idea of what you can do. Sign up, get informed. But one thing, we're going to do it right now. We're going to kick you off um, with showing um, a video about how you can bring something to your community or how communities can start um, from, from themselves. It starts with planning grants on their own to figure out what exactly they need in their community to have a um, school-based health center. So I'm going to share that with you all now. Hello. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about four kids, Bobby, Keisha, Molly, and Sam. This morning, each one of them woke up feeling not quite right, but not quite wrong either. The sun was sunny and people had to go to work, so their parents sent the children to school. And when they arrived, they went to class. But they all tried to feel quite right. However, at 10 o'clock, Bobby had a tummy ache. At 11 o'clock, Keisha couldn't breathe. By noon, Molly's tooth hurt. She couldn't eat her lunch. At 1.15, Sam got into a fight. At 10.10, Bobby's mother left work and picked him up from school. At 11.30, an ambulance took Keisha to the hospital emergency room. At 12.20, Molly went back to class where she couldn't concentrate. At 1.30, Sam received three days of out-of-school suspension. And at 3.30, Principal Dan realized that he had three more absences and one more miserable student. Which all adds up to poor attendance, poor test scores, poor graduation rates, and poor outcomes for kids and schools. So on this very nice, very sunny day, nobody had a good day. But wait, let's rewind. What if we were able to change the story. What if this morning, Bobby and Keisha and Molly and Sam still woke up feeling not quite right, but not quite wrong either. And the sun was still sunny and 
people still had to go to work. Their parents still sent the children to school, and they still went to class. But what if this time there was a health center at the school? We call those school-based health centers. That way, a medical provider, a nurse, a social worker, and maybe even a dentist could examine and treat each child's medical, dental, and behavioral health problems right away and right where they are in school. What if this time at 10 o'clock Bobby had a tummy ache? At 11 o'clock Keisha couldn't breathe. At noon Molly's tooth hurt. She couldn't eat her lunch. At 1:15 Sam felt like fighting. Then what could happen with a school-based health center is this. At 10:10, Bobby sees the nurse who examines him and finds out that his tummy ache is due to missing breakfast. At 11:10, a medical provider treats Keisha's asthma, keeping her out of the emergency room. At 12:20, the medical assistant gives Molly a pain reliever and then helps Molly's mom schedule time with the dentist, who will be at the school tomorrow. And at 1:30, Sam receives behavioral health counseling through the licensed clinical social worker. That all means that this time at 3:30, Principal Dan is happy because the health center at his school prevented four more absences, one more emergency room visit, one more disciplinary action, and one more miserable student. And Principal Dan is extra happy because he knows that now his school is more likely to have higher attendance, higher test scores, higher graduation rates. Plus happier teachers and happier and healthier students. So this time on this very nice, very sunny day, everybody ultimately had a good day. Consider bringing a school-based health center to your school system. It's not as hard as you think. First, gather your community to explore the idea. That means everyone: school people, families, bus drivers, neighbors, doctors, dentists. Community leaders, you get the idea. Then, once everyone has given input, the community decides what services the children in their community need. Here are the things the community decides next: which school is the best school-based health center location to serve kids. By the way, lots of times schools in the same system share a health center. Where should the school-based health center go? In the school, on the grounds, or nearby? What medical provider can sponsor the school-based health center? And finally, how do we ensure the best quality services across the board? Remember, addressing every child's physical, oral, and mental health care needs means children will have better health outcomes and better school attendance. So consider adding a school-based health center to your community. Once you do, everyone can be as happy as Principal Dan. For more information and technical support. Contact the Georgia School-Based Health Alliance. Here's how. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to get our dialogue kicked off and started. I'm Kim Addy, the Senior Director for Health here at United Way. And I am just super thankful and super excited that you guys were here today to deliver really such richness、um, in both your presentations. How many people learned something new today? Wow! Wow! That's the, oh my gosh! That's everybody. <laughs> you can see my excitement. So I was told、um, due to time, I only have like one question. I wish you could see my note cards. I have a lot of.、Um, Questions that I wanted to ask, but I will stick to script and just ask one question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience、um, to engage、um, in some more dialogue. So I won't be stingy in, in, as that in that respect.、Um, and so my theme really、uh, around the question that I want to ask is really around working differently.、Um, you both in your presentations talked about、um, really being creative. We talked about the professional shortage, health shortage, and mental health in that space. Um, and even some of the numbers that you mentioned, fifty、um, plus counties don't have a mental health provider there, and that's a staggering stat. But you also talked about、um, the resiliency of communities, and so、um, in that vein, I would like to know how do we work differently? There was such synergy. 
um, we had some sidebar conversations and there was such synergy between the two of you, um, giving a, a kind of a state lens and a national lens. Um, how do we work differently in communities and what are some examples that you can provide? I know you talked about some of the work that you're doing at Grady around collaborative codes and value-based payments. So I really want to hear from both of you um, in communities to build resistance resiliency, how do we um, work differently and more creatively? I mean, one of the things, um, in addition to how you leverage providers, I mean, one of the great gems of Georgia is the certified peer specialist workforce that you have here. I mean, it's, it's nationally known. Um, and you've got that as an opportunity to deploy skilled people in, that can be trained and knowledgeable. But also, it helps to build economic empowerment because you can get a job um, as a certified peer specialist working in healthcare settings. So that kind of cultural broker between health and healthcare, organizational systems and community is to me one of the, the greatest untapped resource that we have, not just in Georgia, but also nationally. That was the exact answer I was <laughs> going to give. Um, because it, it as, as Dr. Ann noted, it's something Georgia's nationally known for, but it hasn't completely, it's, it's new in some ways, the youth peer support. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had um, certified peer support for families for a while, and then um, DBHDD started the youth program. And we had a panel last week um, for Children's Mental Health Day at the Capitol, and it included some of the youth that were on the video. And there was the leader of the Peer Support Specialist Youth Program of DBHD there, and he asked them, like, if you had someone like me available in your school, your program, or in your after-school program, that someone that had some training and some skills, and it was a confidential resource, but someone a little closer to your age to talk to, and overwhelmingly, they're like, yes, like, I could talk to you. I could immediately tell you things that maybe I wouldn't tell someone else. And so we're working hard here to figure out how to integrate that resource more systematically through our school-based health programs, through our out-of-school time programs, and into our practices. So like we've said, we can't get that reach of a, a licensed provider in every, every community, but we most certainly can build up those who are interested, and particularly those with lived experience that are interested, and in being able to give back and go through that certification program and be able to com become, and um, it's a reimbursable service now. So um, agencies or community providers can employ them um, and be able to use them as a, as a resource. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, I might ask one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to the audience. You are breaking <laughs> the, the rules answer. today. That counts as like one, yeah, right? So right, right, so that gives me a little bit more time. Um, there's been such a groundswell around trauma-informed, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about trauma-informed, it's a really, really important concept because what it does is that it honors people's experiences, um, but it also um, provides ways in which we can embed approaches around care and how care is delivered um, to individuals, children, and families. And I heard you talk a little bit about um, traumatized communities, right? And when you're doing work in place-based settings and, and in communities, there are lots of different things that you can do. But one of the more important things is how do you normalize, right, this idea of trauma-informed? Um, we have in the audience our police force, right, um, which is awesome, right? You hear social media talk a lot negatively, but there are lots of great works and, and lots of different police departments that are doing really great work mm -hmm. to really understand. Um, but how do we begin to normalize this idea of trauma-informed, not just in professional settings, but in communities, in creative ways, right, um, in order to reach children and families when you talk about that no yeah. wrong door? I mean, we've done some really exciting work with Fulton County. Um, on the pre-rest aversion initiative that we we're many of you here, some of you I think were also on the Fulton County redesign team. What we're doing now at Morehouse is being the about part of the evaluation team to look at how do you intercede early. And when I saw your slide about what 76% of youth mm -hmm. in juvenile um, detention, juvenile services mm -hmm. um, needing mental health, like I'm really happy that they're investing in mental health care, but I'd like for them to at not the be crisis there. Head, you know absolutely. what I mean? Like, because that would be better if they weren't in the system at all yeah. and they got the mental health <laughs> care that prevented them from yeah. doing that action. And so that's, I think everyone's on the same page about that. Um, we've had great partnerships with, um, with police and also commissioners in trying to look at it from a societal perspective. But we need more collaborations like that 
to have, it's not even normalization, it's more just acknowledgement of our realities and not um, victim blaming or focusing on an individual problem and solution when it's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the, the most important things about that statistics is that it tells us there was something we could have do we could have done beforehand that if we had paid attention to the signs and intervened we could have created a different path and one of the ways that um, that we're looking to do that here in Georgia is with school resource officers um, in schools and how many are familiar with what those what those are so they are um, they are typically officers either retired or, or active duty um, that are placed in schools to support school safety. And we've seen, and it's you know, been in, the, in social media instances where that has gone awry. Um, and most often when it does, it's due to a lack of understanding or, or, an, or an idea of like, what the behavior is, what's underlying that behavior. Um, because really, first and foremost, their role is to keep kids safe. Um, and so that, that comes a reaction. But if we can get on the front end, of, of understanding behavior, and this past um, this past legislative session, we passed um, a law that required um, training for school resource officers that had an element of child development in that. But our state is actually taking that a step further, and the entity that designs the training, both the initial training and the continuing education of school resource officers across the state, is being. Um, really thoughtful about how to integrate trauma-informed um, crisis de-escalation into that. They're incorporating some of our youth videos into that training so that, um, so that officers are hearing firsthand from youth that, like, that really personal and emotional background of some of the behaviors that they're seeing in the classroom. And, and I just applaud their efforts to try and think differently about how we are supporting that resource in our schools. Um, and looking at sort of all around the state and communities to work directly with, with that resource. Awesome, awesome, thank you. So now I'm going to open up the floor for some more dialogue and questions and discussions. I won't hog our speakers today. Um, so there is a mic roving. We have a question right over here. Good morning, Delano Massey with Come Grow With Us. Just a quick question relating to uh, the interviews that you did with the students. Mm -hmm. So three, four years ago, uh, the strongest driver of suicide for students was bullying. Mm -hmm. Do we know if that's still the case as it relates to the students that were interviewed? So that overwhelmingly came up as well, but an added element to that is the relentlessness of the bullying and that their access to technology mm -hmm. has just provided no respite for it. Um, so that definitely, definitely came up, which is a, another reason why this idea of having the youth, the peer support specialists or youth like that are available in schools to be able to recognize it earlier and be that immediate, um, immediate support is so critical. So yes, that, that has not gone away, unfortunately. Good morning. I'm Jawanda Harris, the Kinship Navigator for Fulton County Defects. And I have two. One is a question and one is a um, comment or a concern. Um, one of the questions is, uh, when are we going to look at our leadership for schools to go from rhetoric to action in the schools? So my program, we work with grandparents raising grandchildren and relatives raising minor relatives. And a lot of the calls that I receive, I'm going into the schools, and I'm Fulton County Schools as well as APS, of concerns surrounding mental health issues and behavior issues. And the rhetoric is there, but the action is not there. Principals are not um, latching on or accepting um, some of the requirements of training their staff and accepting this manner. Um, the second thing is uh, going forward in research and um, policy and implication of these services if we do if we would um, not group kinship families into a single parent or a parent household situation because the dynamics and the character characteristics of those families differ greatly a lot of them um, are exacerbated by grandparents or relatives coming in playing the role of a parent um, two generations removed from parenting. The differences, the policies have changed, the beliefs of there is no mental health issue, they're bad, um, they need to be trained, the discipline, and those things. And so going forward, if you all can um, add that to 
your what you're looking at um, to get results or to look at making sure that those grandparents and those relatives have their um, input put into that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I can. Um, this is a great point. So our parents that work with our community-based parent leadership development program represent kind of the range of family structures, and we do have a number of kinship families that both inform the development of our curriculum and also serve as parent mentors and leaders in our program. And you're absolutely right that family dynamics is a job in and of itself, and it's not a one-size-fit-all approach to solutions. Um, to your first point, we have a partnership with Tuskegee Airmen Global Academy, and by we I mean Morehouse School of Medicine. It includes mentorship, um, STEM education, but also we brought our, pro our parenting program in partnership with that school. Um, one of the interesting things is that while the schools are trying to roll out and implement social emotional <coughs> learning for the teachers and the staff, which I think is kind of what you were referencing, there's also an important um, need to actively engage the parents, especially in communities where there's the greatest need because, again, those same institutional trust issues are present in those schools. <clears throat> And that's why we've been so interested in partnering with the school districts because we live in the communities. Mm -hmm. We know how to get parents to engage with us. We're a trusted partner for them because we're represented by parents from those schools. Um, and we, we, this is kind of one effort to try to implement that. And we do hope that it will expand across um, Atlanta Public Schools. We've also been in conversations with DeKalb and Henry County Schools because it is a partnership. It doesn't help to teach the teachers one thing and then the children hear something else at home. You really need to have coordination of that messaging so that you can um, change the culture and expectation. But you have to be mindful of respecting people's norms and values in that process. So it can't just be coming straight from the top down from the school. You need leadership support and funding and initiative, but it has to be grassroots and bottom up from implementation is my view. Mm -hmm. um, definitely agree with all of those points. Um, we uh, Voices has a project we're embarking on with DFACS and I'd love to get your contact information and part of that work is going to involve um, outreach and education with with kinship families all, all um, and biological as well as traditional foster care families on um, on parenting supports, recognizing de you know developmental milestones, what behavior means, normalizing, um, or, or having um, expectations of, of what child development looks like, and then also how engage how to engage with schools because we overwhelmingly hear what you're saying is that it's not a welcoming place necessarily, and it's very challenging to even understand how to get support or to navigate, and then you're also very protective of the information you wanna share, mm -hmm. because if school leadership isn't welcoming, well, you don't wanna to start to tell your personal business. Right. So I'd love to, to get your information as we start to expand on that project, um, to think about how we can connect. And, and with regard to your question of schools, you know, a really, instrumental factor of the school-based mental health program that I spoke about earlier with the increased investment is about community partnerships and connecting them with school systems. So community mental health providers and them receiving funding to connect with schools and provide services there. But, um, and when you have a provider that really understands the school environment and understands that teachers need support just like their kids because they are experiencing sometimes their own trauma and, and living in the same communities that their students are and then also managing challenging behaviors and really look at um, the milieu, like the whole environment, and that their job is to support the whole environment versus pulling out individual students. Mm -hmm. That can be incredibly impactful in helping sort of have that grassroots swell of support up to school leadership and beyond for the need for that kind of resource and understanding. Um, and I think that the state is working with providing that technical assistance and support to those providers so that they understand how to work in a school setting versus in a typical community, um, community um, outpatient environment. And, and the more we talk about the cases where that's being successful and can model that and that principals that have those programs can talk to other principals that have that program, I think we're going to start to see more of a, more of a shift. 
um, when they were able to just tell each other what's been working for them. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Jordan, a graduate student um, in the Health Administration Program at Columbia University. Um, and I just had a question, how do you recommend incentivizing providers to want to go into kind of more primary care, mental health, clinical base? Because you know, with the healthcare system changing from fee for service to more value based and bundled payments, I mean, how, how do we get providers to want to provide care in these settings? Well, that's a big question. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm so looking forward <laughs> to Because <laughs> honestly, um, you know, I work a lot with trainees too, and it's exciting. It is yeah. a lot of fun. I think, um, you know, the current workforce may have some challenges in learning how to practice differently, but certainly the developing workforce is ready. Um, they're team mm -hmm. based, they're interprofessional, they've trained in a different environment, um, speaking uh, around physicians. Um, the challenge that we're facing now is the lack of opportunity to practice in that setting and to mm -hmm. actually be trained in that setting. So I actually don't think it's going to be as big of a challenge, especially speaking from behavioral health, because it's so rewarding. Um, I love taking care of individual patients. I think I always will. But I've always wanted to help more people. I mean, people go into this yeah. to help people. Mm -hmm. And to be able to help thousands of people on a panel by supporting um, primary care is, is very rewarding. And it's nice for work life, especially a lot of implementations include telebehavioral health. So you can work from home and walk your kid to school and do things while taking care of a larger number of patients when maybe your alternative would be to work part time. And then you're taking care of even fewer patients. So I think that um, as our payment and reimbursement evolves to make it easier to implement, I think that the, the, at least the behavioral health workforce will be very um, excited about it. And primary care is desperate. So okay. they're, 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 they're just waiting for these solutions to become widely available. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think once people get the taste of working in an integrated care, they're going to want more of it. Yeah. I mean, I worked in a school setting, so it was a different type of integrated care, but I'll tell you, once I did it, that's all I wanted to do, because the idea of having a full team around yeah. you to not only brainstorm with and thought partner with, but to then also kind of co-treat, but, but leveraging your different skill sets is so powerful, because you see your outcomes skyrocket from that. Um, so getting that exposure is going to be key. and. Um, I think Georgia's working now to explore how we could develop, and it's one of the reason, many reasons why I'm so excited to hear more about uh, Dr. Wren's work and the work at Morehouse, is to link those training opportunities more explicitly with our social work programs, our psychology programs, our um, um, licensed uh, family marriage um, LMFT, <laughs> marriage family therapy <laughs> programs, um, while they're in school yeah. with those practices. So they get their clinical training already in there and they get the taste for it. Um, and even think about doing that in other parts of, of Georgia. So um, um, making sure we're deliberately thinking about some of the university programs that are in rural Georgia and doing that. Because mm -hmm. that will also be a training ground for those practices to better receive those students. Yes. They'd be doing it together because they'd be trying it out with the support of the university program. Yeah, and we know that if you train in an underserved area, you're more likely to want to serve there. And if we can also get our pipeline going, that's the greatest way to meet the need is by cultivating a pipeline as people that come from those communities are very likely to want to go back and serve there. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the wonderful words that you shared. Uh, my name is Miriam Dormer, and I, I'm the Urban Conservation Director for the Nature Conservancy. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the funding that is, is available through private sector and nonprofits working in similar geographies, but on different issues. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have investments in urban conservation renewal, you know, re improving the natural environment in a way that makes it safer and healthier, more appealing for individuals. We also think about the way that those investments can potentially lead to displacement through, uh, you know, rising property values and that that can cause a type of trauma as well. 
And so one of the things that we're really spending a lot of time thinking, studying, talking to people about is how, um, how, do, how do conservation organizations, and it's not just the Nature Conservancy, the Conservation Fund, American Rivers are all investing in and in enhancing urban environments in terms of the, um, the trees. We know that's related to air quality, heat, um, exposure, but yet we don't have a really clear definition to point to about the role of health, um, the role of environment in improving health outcomes as one of those determinants of health. And then we have some programs that also um, recruit and train people from the community to be involved in th that work so that there is some socio-emotional learning happening as well. Um, so I just wondered if, if you've come across that in your work, really looking, there was a slide up there about the environment being safe and yeah. caring mm -hmm. and nurturing, but when we're talking about the out of doors and getting people to interact yes. with that, how, mm -hmm. do we, how do we partner better with health, health related initiatives so that we can be contributing to those same types of solutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a very important challenge that you've presented to, to us here because we absolutely know that gene by environmental act, you know, interactions are very important to epigenetics and it's not just about what's encoded in your genes, but the air that you breathe, the water you drink, what you put in your body, very important for all health and mental health as well inflammation in the immune system and your and your biosphere all of these things the science is suggesting that it, it really does matter so i think that it, that's a really wonderful challenge for us to think multi-sectoral um, outside of health but also thinking about creative partnerships um, you know you can think of programs that would help to both cultivate knowledge in those communities and also cultivate skill sets where maybe they can actually seek employment around there. I'm a big nature lover and my son's big, they, my kids are always in dirt um, no matter <laughs> where they are. So I am, I am all for those types of partnerships, but you know, it doesn't take something like Flint or other uh, examples where we have actual knowledge of deleterious impacts of health, but we have the CDC here and one of the things they do as a surveillance function is trying to identify kind of pockets of certain conditions that are often influenced by environmental toxins that we may not have the technology to actually even um, detect. So I, I thank you so much for speaking to us about that and I will definitely keep that in my mind in thinking about creative partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, I would. Sorry, the podium's blocking me for saying you. Um, um, I think this is a great example of where people you don't expect that would necessarily, or sectors you wouldn't necessarily expect could, could be a resource in solving this problem actually are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would love to have you to be a part of the Child, Georgia Child Adolescent Health Coalition and be able to come and share because that's what will help take seed is people understanding and hearing directly from you and, and you sharing information with others and those links and those opportunities will just start to come um, because you're having a dialogue. Um, there's a project that Voices works on in the early care and learning world about bringing, it's called farm to mm -hmm. early care and the, the idea of, of increasing the number of fresh produce that young children eat. And um, we were at a center the other day and talking about it, and this center is like kicking it. Like they are incredible. They have just invested with no additional dollars, figured out how to rearrange their budget to buy fresh, locally grown, um, healthy produce and serve it to their kids. And you know, it took them and it took time, um, but it's been incredible. And then she said, and now we're gonna tackle next social emotional. And I was like, but wait a second. <laughs> You already are. You've just talked about how through that you've seen, you've seen dramatic changes in kids recognizing personal space mm -hmm. because of the activities that you're doing. You've talked about all the different things around your your classroom and, and, and how they're outside more and how that has like just elevated the mood and the activities that they're doing. So, I think the more we can, and and that's from people who are doing it and love it and are strong supporters of it, but not necessarily seeing that link that actually through that work you're seeing a behavior change that has been so um, so powerful. So I think the more that we keep having these conversations across sectors and highlighting those um, connections will be helpful. Yeah. So that right there is what this is about, <laughs> right? That connection, so you guys will talk after. And there's gonna be lots of conversations that's gonna 
happen after this inform. Mm -hmm. And that's really the platform that we've created that we want to um, um, ensure that continues to happen. So thank you. Do we have one more? One more? I first want to thank you both for the wealth of information that you shared this morning. It was so enlightening. And so needed. And my, I'm a community health worker. My name is Anthony McLaurin. I'm with Grady. And uh, the information that you shared is so valuable in, in what we all do there. Uh, I do have a question. I was thinking as you were sharing, and I commend you going into the schools because that's a great place to start. But I also thought about um, the stigma that you mentioned early mm -hmm. uh, about persons that seek help mm -hmm. and assistance when there's a behavioral health issues. How do we overcome, overcome some of those stigmas? What kind of community support do we have to provide for parents who has a child that may be, because sometimes it's a little embarrassing for parents when they don't really understand. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I wanted to ask was, how have you looked at maybe working with the faith community? Because mm -hmm. one of the things is most people trust their pastors and their, and their faith families, mm -hmm. and they can help them get through some of those things where they feel stigmatized. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there are a lot of organizations like my fraternity and the 100 Black Men, many social organizations that focus on uh, the exceptional youth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the youth that are A students, the youth that are already, that would do good anyway, mm -hmm. okay? How do we get them to start looking at children that need help and could really use their mentorship mm -hmm. and that could really use the support that could be brought on by some of these organizations? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the short answer to your question is we need more of you. <laughs> we, we need to cultivate more of you and more like you um, because uh, individuals that have your passion and knowledge of community and can make those um, connections are what folks that have kind of decision-making power and resources, they don't have access to that. Um, and I think your point about how do we cultivate the untapped potential is something that we think quite a bit about at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, they also developed a community health worker training program for high school students, mm -hmm. which is like, wow, that is very interesting, creative, and think about what a high school student would know now having worked as a community health worker and being trained in that. Um, we partnered with the Robert Jane Brown Foundation and just recently put on a, a STEAM revolution at Morehouse School of Medicine. Where we brought in hundreds of children, um, exposed them to leadership, military academy, all kinds of tech and sciences, and we're, we're thinking about how can we cultivate that partnership more to not just engage the students that kind of are exceptional, but the community of students, because for some it might be working at Google, for others it might just be learning how to code and getting a job doing that. And as you expose the children to certain knowledge, you can also engage the parents. That's what we do with um, Tuskegee Airmen Global, Global Academy. We engage the children in STEM, we mentor the children, but then we also then can engage the parents and provide them resources as well. Um, so thank you so much for the work that you do in community. Um, you also asked a question about faith partnerships. Very important um, network. I do some work nationally around educating faith leaders around mental health. Um, and we also, with Mental Health Month, I'll be doing Facebook Live with Kay Warren from Saddleback Church later this month on that. So 100% agree with that, those suggestions. Um, you know, it, I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't challenging for us to figure out how to do that. Um, one of our strongest partners who is incredible is the Interfaith Children's Movement. Um, but she's one person, and, and she does incredible work all around the state. But um, I think, one, talking after this and being able to figure out how we can support um, our organizations and, and connections can support one another. It's one of the reasons why we created the videos, because it's one way where we can get the information out, both to answer your first question about stigma, but also to get more people involved, because they can see that it's youth from all different backgrounds, all different skill sets, all different needs, um, having the same issue that they need support. Um, and even something like facilitating a dialogue with some members of the different organizations or in communities where some of the youth came from who were willing to come and tell their story, to be able to go and meet with some of those leaders, um, I think could be 
could be helpful. So I'd love to connect with you afterwards to figure out how we can make some of those connections. Yeah. And yet again. Another connection. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Assistant Chief Sonia Porter. I'm with the DeKalb County Police Department. So my question is, do you have any partnerships with any of your law enforcement um, within the metro area? And I ask that because we see, you know, we encounter mental health in a, in a different way. We normally encounter it when people are at their lowest or their families are at their lowest. So we as a department are starting our um, mental health roundtables where we're doing you know, communication with wow. psychiatrists and wow. psychologists, social workers. And we're doing our, we're gonna set up our lunch and learn that we have, um, that we're gonna have in July, July 15th. But my question is how do we, as law enforcement, have better relationships with people to help us to help them? Because when, you, when we receive a 911 call, it is, now we're to react to that. Right. Whereas if we had some other resources that could respond to those calls, either with us or before us or for us, because sometimes when we come, we're already in an authoritative state. So the situation is gonna be different. Mm -hmm. So if you could, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think you stepped out earlier when I was talking about our work with Fulton County and the pre-arrest diversion initiative. So we had done quite a bit of work the past uh, couple years with Fulton County. Um, and I believe Brian McGregor is the um, researcher from Morehouse that kind of leads this scope of work. And I, I believe that he's actually been to some of those conversations in DeKalb County. I know that it has come up in our discussion. So we're absolutely willing to partner with you to see how we can support um, your efforts. Um, one of the things that we're really good at is kind of doing a system-wide assessment, looking at what you're doing, identifying some practical opportunities to get started. Um, you know, what's common around here, you may have heard of the Stepping Up Initiative and CIT training for police mm -hmm. officers, which is a 40-hour training, which is a large investment for certain um, units. But then there's also the eight-hour mental health first aid for public safety officials, which is maybe more practical, something that's like baseline knowledge that everyone should have. So definitely, those are some types of initiatives. But also, we'd be happy to help you also uh, implement the sequential intercept model to see how can you engage more upstream. We did that with Grady EMS in our upstream crisis intervention team that sent out a behavioral health worker um, and an EMT worker in a van to do interventions for calls. You have to be prescriptive about what types of calls are appropriate for that. But then what's great about it is then you can do proactive outreach. So, you know, we think of police as responders, but police are part of the community. Mm -hmm. and when you have people assigned to certain areas, that's an opportunity to cultivate relationships. Now, the police is your friend. We need so much more of that in our communities for the, the local police that are custodians of those areas to develop those partnerships with communities. Mm -hmm. So thanks, we, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> um, this came up on Tuesday as part of a discussion um, with the Georgia Crisis Access Line, yeah. GCAL, and that their role, as, as you're familiar, is to actually send um, a mental health expert or a crisis detection expert to, to the home and sit down and work with a family directly to de-escalate. And the challenge is, which is the challenge that they were talking about on Tuesday, is that sometimes it takes one to two hours yeah. to get someone there. And you come, thankfully, <laughs> right away, which is great. <laughs> Um, so if they aren't a part of, if Wendy Farmer, her group yeah. is not a part of some of the roundtables or dialogue with you, I would encourage you to have her be a part of that. And maybe there is something, yeah. as you all connect, um, to think about something different, yeah. something about different that could be done. Because even if you at least know they're coming in an hour, yeah. or you, there's some that you know, like they're able to contact with you, that you know they're coming, that might change the way offices are able to yeah. de-escalate and respond. Wendy is a great partner, and I think she's um, just recently um, looking at implementing some solutions specific to child and adolescents, so mm -hmm. I'm also happy to, to connect you with her. Um, they're really great partners. Thank you, and yet again, another connection, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna keep this conversation going, I promise. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. My time has ended. Um, I really, really thank you for your engagement and your thoughtful questions and the thoughtful discussion, so thank you. I'll turn it over to Etha Henry, our Executive Vice President for Community Engagement. Well, if I were creating a prototype for what the Inforum should be, it would be this informal session, right? It was great. Heartfelt thanks to our speakers. 
So we have learned a lot in the room, but what is most impressive and what we really want to happen is that you learn and you take back to your individual organizations, but we also want you to connect. We want to see the partnerships growing in the room. And does it do my heart good to see the unsuspecting yeah. partner stand up and say, you know, how can I get involved with you? And to hear the panel say immediately, yes, we can connect. This is what we're looking for in the forum because in all the topics we have had, they are so critical to the work that we're leading around child well-being, changing the trajectory for children, creating resilient communities, and so today, um, I just thank you for coming, and I thank you for continuing to come um, to the series. Um, I, you know, I, I, Tiffany knows me, so she did give me a script. So let me try to um, get back to it. <laughs> um, there's some uh, uh, things that I need to say. So um, you will also notice that today, we have some resources um, in the uh, outside in the foyer, and um, we want to encourage you to look at those resources, and we want to thank our partners who took the time to bring resources. They are Children's Healthcare of at Atlanta, Chris 180, I still want to say Chris Kids, Camp Twin Lakes, mm -hmm. DBHDD, Fulton DeKalb Hospital Authority, Jewish Family and Career Services. Kate's Club, Hillside Inc., The Link Counseling Center, Metropolitan Counseling Services, Odyssey Community Center, and Vox Teen Communications. Please give them a hand for helping us. Um, we also want to remind you that um, the series continues and we will be back to the gathering spot. Um, for the next event, which is when? Sorry. June 17th. Thank you. Which is June 17th. And so we really um, invite you uh, to um, come out and be a part of that. We will have as our um, speaker and as conversation will center around Dr. Joshua Kramer with the National Center for Family Learning. Um, and we'll be um, looking at literacy across the two-gen spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that will be very important again as we continue to dig deep and to strengthen our knowledge and capacity, but more importantly, because most of us have our knowledge, we know what we know, we're professionals, but what we really want to do and learn better is how we partner with communities, mm -hmm. how we help them to have the given authority to drive their own lives. And so um, we continue very much in each session um, to look at how um, we build those skills. So the last thing I think I'm supposed to do is to remind you that we have been asking you to participate and that when you look at the screen, um, you'll be able to enter a code uh, 59, 13, 10. Um, and what we're trying to do here is for you to tell us, you know, um, what it is that your organization is doing, anything that is coming up. Again, as we seek to create this community um, of partnership and exchange um, important information. So this is the time for you to get up on the screen um, anything that's happening that you want us to know um, about. Oh, I got the thumbs up. I think I covered everything on the piece of paper. I'm very good at going on about other things and missing the points on the paper. So um, thank you again for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in June. And again, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.